When you think of serial killers, you likely think of the perverse greats of Jeffrey Dahmer, Jack the Ripper, or Ted Bundy. Those are the men who affect even our pop culture with countless true crime series, internet theories, or podcasts, movies about and inspired by their crimes. They have likely inhabited the TV screens in your living room. You also have likely never heard about John Norman Collins. I never did. That's what interested me about him. He seemed to be a prolific serial killer who stalked the very university I attend, and yet I'd never even heard of him until last semester. I have a few theories why that is, but that's not the point of my project. Not many historians study serial killers. In the 1960s in particular, if they do study specific crimes, they are typically the ones with high profile victims or culprits, like the assassinations of JFK, Robert F. Kennedy, and Martin Luther King Jr. More commonly, studies are done on crime and violence in general in the 1960s. Much of this, however, is studied in large urban populations with broad-based socio-political implications. The career girl murders gender, race, and crime in 1960s New York by Marilyn S. Johnson tells how conservatives and police officers exploited the crime epidemic to fight against police reform, civil rights movements, and female empowerment and liberal law and order. The Politics of Police Reform in Los Angeles by Max Velker Cantor tells of the failures of police reform in Los Angeles. That is not to say that there has not been studies of crime around college campuses. Social Construction of Rape at Columbia University and in Bernard College, uh, 1955 through 1990, acknowledges that the problem of rape against women on college campuses was not taken seriously until the 1980s, and it was oftentimes viewed in the general scope of crime and assumed that it was perpetrated by outsiders, not fellow students. This paper, however, takes a smaller view of crime in a smaller area, Ypsilanti, where most of the victims were found um, or attended school. Ypsilanti only had a population of 30,000 in 1970. Between the narrow scope and the sensationalism of the crime, this may seem unlikely to be a topic for a historian and more the work of journalists. Indeed, the most comprehensive work around Collins, which I drew heavily upon to write this paper, was The Michigan Murderers, written by crime journalist Edward Keyes. However, sensationalism is not a disqualifier for scholarly study. In fact, it is essential to study sensational events as the reactions of the public can have historical significance. The way to study sensational topics is to avoid embellishment and tell the story of the event and the public's reaction to said event. Speaking of which, in this paper, I actually argue that the public's reaction was counterproductive and John Norman Collins' conviction was prolonged because of the apprehension of police officers to take action because of the public backlash they were facing. Um, the bringing of outside help that ultimately ended up being a distraction and by forcing the police to, take, to chase false leads. It is a little cruel that I utilize the very newspapers that I am criticizing as my primary sources to back up my thesis, but the coverage was thorough if not over the top. So the story is that John Norman Collins was a serial killer, as you've likely gathered by now, who haunted the streets of Ypsilanti and Ann Arbor from 1967 to 1969. During that time, it is believed that he killed seven women, previously thought to be eight, six of them being in the Ypsilanti Ann Arbor area. His victims' ages ranged from 13 to 23, and due to the fact they were all women, he was given the name of the co-ed killer. He was eventually arrested in 1969 and convicted in 1970 for the murder of Karen Sue Bynaman, his last victim. He was punished with a lifetime of maximum security prison, a sentence he is still serving out today in Marquette Maximum Security Prison.